Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. People pursue what they prize. People do what they love. People seek what they value. People pay a price for what they consider worthy. There will be no pursuing of Christ as the prize until we first of all prize him. You won't seek the prize unless you buy into the fact that Jesus is the prize. Can you imagine receiving a call and learning that a large inheritance has been left to you? Like most people, you wouldn't dare drag your feet or let it go unclaimed. Today on Know the Truth, we'll learn that we too have received such a call to a much greater eternal inheritance in Christ. Join us as Philip DeCourcy reads from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, and teaches us what we must do to attain the prize. Now, here's Philip with his message titled, Fast Forward, from his Take the Call series. We're in our series, Take the Call, and we're going to be in it for a few more months. I'm enjoying it. I hope you are, but more than enjoying it, I hope it's changing us where we're living our lives on target for Jesus Christ. We're coming to another call, the call heavenward. So let's come and look at this text. Let's hit the fast forward button in our lives and push towards this goal and prize. Several things. Number one, if you're taking notes, the confession. The confession. This is verse 12. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. This section begins with a confession. Now, it's not a confession of failure. It's a confession of incompleteness. Not that I have already attained. Attained what? Well, immediately it would be verse 11. I haven't attained the resurrection from out among the dead, which according to verses 20 and 21 means glorification with Christ, like Christ, forever with the Lord. That hasn't happened, and Paul is confessing that. Paul's confessing that he's in process. So that's the confession. Secondly, Not only do you have the confession, you have the captivation. The captivation. In the first half of this chapter, Paul admits to having been taken captive by the gospel through a reassessment of his life in the light of Jesus' surpassing worth. Remember he uses that term, what was gain I count loss. I've discovered that Jesus is the pearl of great price. He's everything to me, so everything else is nothing to me in a relative sense. And whatever gets in the way of me knowing him and his power and the fellowship of his son, Suffering, I push aside, I throw overboard, I cut ties with. Because I'm captivated by Him. Look at verse 12. Not that I have already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I might lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. He's telling us that Christ has taken possession of His life. For a glorious end. What's that glorious end? It's at the end of chapter 3. That he'll be conformed in the Jesus image. He'll be forever with the Lord. That serving the Lord and obeying the Lord will be done naturally and wonderfully in the life to come. There'll be no fight with sin. There'll be no disconsonance between what he is and what he wants to be. This is his goal. And he has discovered the full implication of that. And therefore, he's chasing Christ. The Christ who chased him, he's chasing. The Christ that laid hold of him, he's laying hold of. The Christ who owns him, he wants to own more fully. That's what we're reading here. So there's a captivation in this text. Christ is his prize. He's already told us that, right? Verse 8, Christ is of surpassing value. And he tells us here that's the price to which he's running after. I want you to think about this just briefly. There will be no pursuing of Christ as the prize until we first of all prize Him. 
You won't seek the prize unless you buy into the fact that Jesus is the prize. People pursue what they prize. You know that. People do what they love. People seek what they value. People pay a price for what they consider worthy. And that's true of the Christian life. Why do you and I not pursue Christ more than we do? Because we don't prize him enough. We haven't bought into this thought in verse 8 that he is of surpassing value. Once we buy into that, there's nobody like him. Nobody has done anything more for us than him. Nobody will love us more than him. That he's glorious. He's a treasure. That he is the pearl of great price. Remember Jesus told that story about the kingdom of God, about the man that happened to be in a field and come across the fact that there was a treasure in that field, a pearl of great price. And he buries it again. He looks around to see if anybody saw what he discovered. And then he slinks away to go and buy the field from out under the man who doesn't know what is in his field. And he buys that field. He pays anything for that field because of the pearl of great price. And you know what? People around us will think we're nuts by the way we live and the things we give up and the things we won't do. But they don't understand what we have discovered. We've discovered who Jesus is. We've discovered he's the, he's the son of righteousness. He's the desire of the nations. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the begotten of the father full of truth and grace. He's the life, the truth, and the way. He's the one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. He's the morning star. I mean, do I need to go on? I mean, when when you wrap your head around that stuff, when you you get an understanding of that, then you'll agree with the Puritan Ralph Robinson, the Lord Jesus is all things and to all persons that have a saving interest in Him. So you've got the confession I haven't attained the fullness of God's saving purposes in my life. It started with justification. It continues with sanctification. And someday it's going to end in glorification when I'll be conformed in my body to Him. I'll be conformed in my desires to Him. I will be with Him. That's the goal to which I drive. And so I'm in process. I'm not there. And every day I want to get closer and closer to where I'm not and what I'm not. And you know what you know, drives me forward? You know what pulls me Forward, it, it's the thought of who he is and what he's done and how glorious a Savior our Lord is. Which brings about the concentration. Paul is captured by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ isn't something to Paul. Jesus Christ is everything to Paul. For me to live is Christ. Whether by life or by death, I want to magnify Him in my body. To die is gain because it means I will be with Christ, which is far better. I think you've got that. So here's what he says. Therefore, I press on. I want to own all that Christ has owned me for. Therefore, verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. I reach forward to the things which are ahead. That is, resurrection from out among the dead and glorification at the rapture. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Captured by this one thing, this one glorious person, Paul presses, strains towards the goal of resurrection and the prize of fullness of life in Jesus Christ. Uppermost in Paul's mind is heaven. He wants to be in heaven. He wants to go to heaven. And not so much for what is there, but for who is there to be with Christ. There's an old hymn that has a line in it I grew up singing as a boy, where Jesus is, tis heaven there. Paul embraces that. And so he concentrates on this one thing 
this one glorious person. He concentrates on this hope and end and goal of being with Christ and being like Christ. But I want you to notice just that language, the language of concentration. This one thing I do. Now notice in your English Bibles, the I do is in italics. The Greek is literally one thing. It's abrupt. It's in your face. One thing. Paul's defined by one thing. Paul's occupied by one thing. Everything in Paul's life gathers around this one thing. And it's Christ and the pursuit of Christ and to know him more fully. All of Paul's energies and effort is directed in the end of knowing Christ more fully and being with Christ finally. Body, mind, soul, strength. Christ is life's holy grail for the Apostle Paul. Now, the language comes from the sports arena. I think you get that. I press on. I reach forward. I press towards the goal. It's the straining of the athlete at the finish line. We've all seen it captured in those iconic photographs at the Olympics or something like that, where the athlete is pressing towards the tape. Agony written all over their face, their chest stuck out, their muscles stretched to full capacity, their eyes riveted on the mark, the finish line, the goal. That's the picture Paul uses here. Paul is speaking about the clarifying unity, the empowering reality of a single priority. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 86 verse 11, Unite my heart to fear your name. Don't we need as men to unite our hearts? Isn't it easy to get dragged around in life? To get diffused and distracted? It's very hard to work on keeping some the clarifying unity and the empowering reality of a single priority in our lives. It's not that you lack a desire to serve Him. What you lack is concentration. What you lack is a determined effort to make Him first in your life by doing those things that make Him the one thing. By managing your time so that you have time for Him. By saying no to bad things and even say no to good things so that you can give yourself to the best thing, which is Him. That's what we don't do. We play at it rather than press on toward the goal. So many Christians are sitting. Others are stumbling. Where are the men straining, stretching towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? Where is the muscular Christianity that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, I run so as to win. Let's be honest, I challenge myself. If someone looked at your life, followed you for a week, and watched your time, and noticed your emotions and your energies that will express themselves across a week, would they see you running to win Jesus Christ? Is that the thing that will be most clear about you and your week and your emotions and your efforts and your energies. Paul says, I discipline myself. I beat my body into subjection. I control my emotions. I discipline my desires. I focus my life. Where is the exercise of spiritual disciplines? 1 Timothy 4 verse 7, where Paul says, you know what? Bodily exercise profits for a little, but it's only good for this life. Exercise yourself unto godliness, which is profitable for the life to come. Again, that's a strong word. Exercise. Takes effort. Takes effort. Any theology of discipleship that has you passive is not biblical. It's active. It requires effort. You have got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to bring about His will. No quick fixes. No easy fixes in the Christian life. Don't ever buy a theology that tells you that, you know what, with the laying on of hands, with some prayer, with some experience of the Holy Spirit, that the Christian life becomes easy. 
that there's some instant maturity in Christ's likeness that comes from that. That's just not true. Paul uses the language of athleticism, exercise, discipline, pursue, put some effort into. I love that little theme of one thing. I, was, I wrote it down to myself one day as I thought about it. One thing I desire. Isn't that what David says in Psalm 27 verse 4? I desire to worship in your house and to behold your glory. Remember what Jesus said to Martha? Martha, one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part that shall not be taken away from her. Martha was all at sixes and sevens and her life was distracted and frustrated. And Jesus said, you know what you need to do, Martha? Hey, hey, Martha, I had to say it twice. When Jesus has to speak to you twice to get your attention, it's never a good thing. Come over here and sit down. You need my word. One thing I desire, one thing I need, one thing I know. John 9, 25, I love that. The man who was healed from his blindness, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Isn't that John Newton? Amazing grace, I sweet the sign that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. Was lost, and now I'm found. One thing I do, Philippians three thirteen. That's Paul. We need focus in our Christian lives. We need constant, concentrated effort in our Christian lives. We need some planned neglect. Planned neglect. You're going to have to plan to neglect certain things in your life so that you can spend more time pursuing Christ. We're not talking about neglecting the things you must do, like take care of your family and serve in the church. We're talking about those things that you and I have choices concerning. The bandwidth that we find in life a little bit. What do we do with that time? Let's have some plan neglect. Let's do the, the one thing. I've told you before that George W. Bush, when he was running in 1994 against Ann Richards for the governor of the state of Texas, proved to be a very disciplined political candidate. In fact, he ran on four issues. Education reform, welfare reform, juvenile reform, and tort reform. In fact, he hammered that on the stump in every press conference like a carpenter hammering the nail home. Education reform, welfare reform, juvenile reform, and tort reform. In fact, many years later, those who were part of that campaign on both sides, Democrat and Republican, they tell you they can all remember those four points. In fact, it got so bad and so persistent in the driving home of the message that an exasperated reporter asked him during a press conference what his fifth goal as governor would be, to which George Bush famously replied to pass the first four. I love it. There's a man on a mission. There's a man driven and defined by goals. He had four things he was going to do. And the fifth thing was to get them done. Paul was a man of one thing. He was disciplined. Guys, are we disciplined? Is the Lord's day a carved out and sacred moment in our week? Is our time before the Lord in the word and prayer on a given day guarded and protected throughout the day in the midst of a world with all its temptations and its distractions? Is Jesus constantly being brought before your mind as the one thing. In every conversation, he's the one thing. In every action, he's the one thing. Let's move on to another thought here, the cancellation. This is one of my favorite passages, by the way. I don't know if you've noticed that. But I love this section. In fact, Philippians is probably, if you pushed me, my favorite book in the Bible. In chapter 3 and 4 are outstanding. The cancellation. Okay? Now remember, he's defined and driven by one thing. All of his energies and his efforts are corralled and pushed towards the gaining of the prize, the upward call to heaven, being with Jesus. He's in process. He has been justified and declared righteous. 
He's now being made righteous progressively. And someday in the presence of God, when he is saved to sin no more, he will be righteousness and he will reflect in body, mind, and action the glory of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he acknowledges for there to be the one thing I've got to forget and pay no attention to other things, the things that will impede the one thing. And so that's why he he says, look at verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things, one thing, forgetting the other things, I reach forward and I press towards the goal, the prize of the heavenward call. Focusing on the one thing by necessity involves forgetting about, relegating, paying no attention to the other things that distract. Remember Jesus in that situation with Martha and Mary? He has to rebuke Martha. And what does he say, Martha, Martha? You are worried about many things. And those many things that you're focusing your attention on and getting frustrated by is taking you away from the one thing. And so pursuing Christ for Paul not only necessitates a holy discontentment, it necessitates a holy amnesia. And I'm not sure the word amnesia is the right word, because when Paul says here, forgetting those things which are behind, he can't be meaning that he can erase from his memory things that were part of his life. In fact, the Bible doesn't use the word forget in terms of of erasion or amnesia. In fact, when we read in Hebrews 10 verse 17 that God will remember our sins no more, that's not possible for a God marked by omniscience. What that verse is saying that God will not treat us on the basis of those sins anymore. God will not pay attention to those sins anymore. That's not what God will think about when he thinks about us, because in the blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Christ, he thinks about Christ when he thinks about us, united to Christ, hidden in God in Christ. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. I'm so glad you pondered the upward call of God with us today. You can find today's message, Fast Forward, and the rest of our current series by going online to ktt.org. On our website, you can also access other sermons and resources by Pastor Philip that will help strengthen your walk with God. As we ponder the Christian call, we can be certain that it is God's will for us to share Him with others. And that's our mission here at Know the Truth. And it's because of our partnership with friends like you that this is possible. You, too, can be part of this mission by becoming a Truth Ambassador. These valued partners commit a monthly gift of $25, $50, or maybe more, and in turn, receive special resources. This month, along with our welcome package, you'll receive our new custom-designed Know the Truth stainless steel water bottle so you can represent the mission everywhere you go. So become a Truth Ambassador or give a one-time gift online at ktt.org or by calling 888-644-8811. However you choose to give today, we'll send you a book called Where Do We Go From Here? How Tomorrow's Prophecies Foreshadow Today's Problems by Dr. David Jeremiah. Whether you are new to biblical prophecy or a longtime student of the Bible, this timely book will encourage you to set your mind fully on the hope we have in God's sovereignty over history and on the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's yours for a gift of any amount. Just call in your donation to 888-644-8811 or give it online at ktt.org. One last thing, if you're looking for a church to call home, you're invited to join us at Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills. You'll find service times and further details online at ktt.org. And be sure to let us know you're part of the Know the Truth family. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Be sure to join us again next time for more bold, clear, convicting Bible teaching on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm